And it is, you know, it's a lifelong thing, those connections that get made in those early years of, of an adoptee's life, especially when they're separated right at the very beginning of their lives and, and do not have that chance to have those hormonal, psychological things happen between mother and child. You know, if any of you are aware of Mahler, who, who wrote about separation, um, she said, you know, the, the cutting of the umbilical cord has nothing to do with the real separation between mother and child because it's only the physical separation. The psychological separation takes takes time over the first, at least the first year of life, to be completed so that the baby actually knows it's separate from the mother. So that's why a lot of adoptees will say, I feel as if part of myself is missing. And the mother feels that as well. So um, that's one of the reasons that, that you have that kind of feeling of emptiness inside. So adoptees don't remember what happened. They don't remember they were born. They don't remember that their mother has disappeared. But their body remembers that. Their body remembers this absence of her, this, this absence or this cutting off of something of themselves. So <clears throat> some of the things that I talk about in the first part of the book has to do with, with becoming aware of these things, becoming aware of what it is that creates the behavior, the attitudes, the feelings that you have. And one of the things, um, one of the things that, that is different. I mean, we know that the birth mothers are also very traumatized by the separation, even if, even if they choose to do this. Most of them, you know, in the time that I'm talking about, didn't choose it themselves. It was kind of imposed upon them. But even if they choose to do this, I get I get emails from women quite often who say, "I gave up my baby two months ago, and I can't stand it. I want her back. Can you help me get her back?" You know, and. And of course, they have these mothers sign these papers way too soon because they are sometimes even still under the influence of drugs that they give them and things like that. I mean, it's it's not really very straightforward sometimes. And and of course, I've said this to some, some of the mothers in here, some of the adopted mothers that probably are horrified to hear it, but I absolutely do not think that the adoptive parents should be in the birthing room, in the... And I don't, because it's very coercive. How is that mother, when she gives birth to that baby, and that baby becomes really real to her, going to say, oh, I'm sorry, but I don't think I can do this? And she might. There was a big case about that one time. We said, we just signed a contract. It's like, you know, we, we shouldn't be signing contracts for people's lives. I'm sorry, but that, that just shouldn't happen. So... So they have this trauma as well. No matter when they do it or who makes the decision or whatever, they also have this trauma. Now the difference between the, the birth mother having the trauma and the adoptee having the trauma is that the birth mother has a context for it. The birth mother knows what happened. She was there. And even though sometimes there is some amnesia around it, sometimes they can't remember exactly which day they gave birth. The baby was, they can remember the day they went to the hospital sometimes, but not with, whether the baby was born that day or the next day. But they remember something, and they know that their attitude toward people, toward themselves, toward the world was different before they had this thing happen to them. So they have a context for the way they are in the world. The adoptee doesn't have any of that context, because as far as they know, this is just the way I am, this is just the way it is. Because they don't know any different. They know something doesn't feel quite right, something feels a little, what somebody said, it feels like sandpaper when I'm next to my adoptive mom. You know, it's, she has a different rhythm. She has a different, she has a different resonance. And this makes a difference to the child. And it makes a difference to the mother. I mean, one of the things we have to realize is when the child is struggling with some of these things, the mother is also struggling with it. She's struggling with no, no genetic cues just as much as the child is struggling with no genetic cues. She doesn't know it. She just wonders why this kid is acting the way they're acting. And the kid wonders why, why, why is mom the way she is? Why does she feel so wrong somehow? So if we understand these things, we can sometimes deal with them. We can talk about them. We can put them out there. Because it's the, the unspoken things that are so difficult. And of course, the adopters can't speak about it because they, they don't have the words for it. 
So, which is why I wrote my first book, to put words to their experience, to their feelings, to their attitudes, and so forth. And, and as I told people yesterday um, in, the, in the talk about the primal wound, I am not writing about anybody in that book. I'm not writing about any personalities, any character traits. I'm writing about coping mechanisms. So the whole book on primal wound is about coping mechanisms. How people react to that loss of the first mother. Because as I said yesterday, I get all these emails from adoptees saying, oh, you know me better than anybody. <coughs> well, no, I don't. <laughs> I don't know you, but I know how you may have responded to the loss of your mother. You know, it's, it's just like people who come back from the war respond to that as well. You know, when the helicopter goes over, they run for it to cover. Things like that. This is sort of a, a form of PTSD, the way adoptees respond to things. And, and, and of course, because they are making all these billions of neurons at the beginning of their life, and their, their brains are being wired according to these experiences that they're having, and they're having these experiences during trauma, they get imprinted very deeply. And they're very difficult to deal with. So everyone needs to understand that. They're not trying to be mean to you. They're trying to be, they're trying to make themselves safe. That's the whole thing. They don't want another one of these experiences that they don't even remember to happen again. And adoptees don't know this either. I mean, I can't even tell you how many, how many times thousands of letters I've gotten from adoptees talking about how they finally understand what it is and that they aren't alone. I mean, every single one of them probably thought they were alone, right, in the beginning because they didn't, they didn't know anybody else that felt the way they did. Adoptees don't talk to each other about this very much because it doesn't seem like it should be a problem. In our society, adoption is seen as this altruistic, wonderful thing. And, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the things we do around birth and having children are all done for the adults, not for the children. Now, when they were adopting from the, the foster care system, then that becomes more about being for the children as long as everybody understands what it also means as far as adoption is concerned. But because some of these kids really do want to have permanent homes as long as they're very careful not to take them away from homes where they could be with their some biological person in there. Okay, so, so I need to make adoptees aware of certain things having to do with this experience they had, that it isn't that you are a bad kid because you're acting out all over the place, it's because you're trying to, you're trying to save yourself from something horrible that you don't even know how to describe. And, and you're not being this really clingy kid that won't let your mother go and can't stand to go to camp because she, she might disappear while you're gone. That's not because you're, you are so insecure. It's because you have had this happen to you before. And so you have a memory of it in this implicit memory, this memory of yourselves and your psychology and all of that part of you that doesn't have recall. So it's, it's very important to become aware. Um, you know, one of the things that, that has to happen is that you have to start challenging those core beliefs that come. You know, we always try to make meaning of everything that happens to ourselves, right? We try to make meaning of it. Every, there's a saying that people have, and I don't know if I agree with it or not, that everything happens for a reason. Well, I think that's part of our arrogance to think that we can make a reason out of everything, you know? The way we like to intellectualize things. Even sometimes when we have a really good intuition about maybe I shouldn't do that, but then we can convince ourselves that it would be a good idea to do anyway. You know, I mean, you can intellectualize anything. You can make it okay. But the, those core beliefs that are formed in the very beginning of life, when, when your mother has disappeared, what, what do children do when something happens in their lives? They, they believe it's about them. They, they're, they're in this narcissistic phase of development, which people hate to talk about because they don't like that, that phrase, narcissistic, you know, narcissism is a bad thing in our society, right? It means you just care nothing about anybody but yourself. Well, you know, when you have been traumatized at that time of your life, then you probably are kind of stuck in that, that part of your evolution, so your, your emotional evolution. 
So it's very important to know that. You know, when I, I know I have a lot of mothers tell me, you know, she's, she just cares nothing but about herself. Well, that part of herself didn't get fulfilled. So she's still looking for it. You know, she's still yearning for that part of herself that didn't get fulfilled. Okay, so that's one of the core beliefs. That it must be my fault that my mother left me. I mean, why else would a mother leave a baby? Mothers don't do that. Certainly nobody would believe that the priest could, told her that it should be a good idea because it's not okay to be a unwed mother or that the social workers thought it would be a good idea because she doesn't even have a husband. Or, you know, couldn't be that. Must be something's wrong with me. You know, kids do this when they when the parents get a divorce. They they think they're at fault for their parents getting a divorce because they're still in that stage where everything's about them. So these core beliefs, um, there there are many of them. I'm not okay. I'm not good enough because after all, mom didn't keep me. And the other part of that is, and it doesn't seem like I'm doing a very good job of fitting into this family either because I'm not very much like them and I can't quite figure things out. And um, I'm always trying to figure out every day how to be in this family. They become, you know, adopted become absolutely wonderful observers. 